In Washington in March 1935, President Roosevelt approved the constitution of the new Philippine Commonwealth, another step toward Philippine independence. But in the islands themselves, the preparation for that long-sought freedom was interrupted in December 1941 and the months that followed by Japanese assault troops. In May 1942, the Japanese won Corregidor, and General Jonathan Wainwright was forced to surrender all his forces in the Philippines. The United States suffered a humiliating defeat. But the large majority of the Filipinos remained loyal to the U.S. while working toward the day of their liberation. Below the equator, U.S. forces were mounting an offensive which was to carry them to final victory in the Pacific. In mid-1944, U.S. forces seized the Marianas. But where to strike next? Should the Philippine Islands be invaded? Or as the Navy advocated, should the next move be to Formosa and then the China coast? In Honolulu in mid-July 1944, Admiral Chester Nimitz summed up the advantages of the Formosa plan for an interested listener who expressed enthusiasm for the idea and seemed definitely opposed to General MacArthur's proposed Philippine operation. But as the conference continued, the general argued so convincingly for permission to make good his promise to return to the Philippines that the president finally endorsed his plan. U.S. forces in the Western Pacific had progressed by September 44 to Moratay and Palau. One month later, a strong invasion armada moved toward the island of Leyte in the vulnerable central Philippines. The carriers continued their attacks against enemy targets throughout the Philippines. October, the invasion fleet began the last leg of the trip to the objective. The mighty armada included combat and assault vessels of all types, escorted by six battleships. Aboard the cruiser Nashville, General MacArthur was confident of the success of his mission as he surveyed the powerful fleet. This impressive convoy was transporting some 170,000 American soldiers to the invasion beaches on Leyte. GIs from Oregon and Ohio, Mississippi and Montana, all intent on paying the Japanese back for Bataan and Corregidor. On the morning of October 20th, the invasion fleet stood off Leyte, and the assault troops moved toward shore near Tacloban. The first wave was scheduled to hit the beach at 10 o'clock. The assault on Leyte carried the fighting forces of the Southwest Pacific some 2,500 miles from the point on New Guinea where the offensive against the enemy in that theater had begun. Right on schedule, the assault troops landed. Soldiers of the 10th Corps of the U.S. 6th Army the landing near Tacloban went off smoothly, and U.S. forces quickly set about securing a position of sufficient area to facilitate a successful defense. 
On the Nashville, General MacArthur and Philippine President Sergio Osmeña prepared to go ashore several hours after the first waves landed. Osmeña was returning to his native land after an absence of some two and a half years. The general set foot on Philippine soil for the first time since his departure from Corregidor in March 1942. About 20 miles to the south at Dulag, GIs of the 24th Corps made a second landing, coordinated with the invasion near Tacloban. By the end of D-Day, the beaches were secure, and the area was given a careful going over for enemy mines. While the beachhead was being cleared, the 96th Division advanced along the flank. At Dulag, too, the invasion was a complete success. But the U.S. advantage was not to go unchallenged. Two American submarines, the Darter and the Dace, proceeding through a narrow channel off Palawan in the western Philippines in the early morning of October 23rd, spotted a strong enemy naval force and promptly attacked. Torpedo attacks were made on three enemy cruisers. Two of the cruisers were sunk, one damaged. This engagement was the prelude to one of the most memorable battles in naval history. The U.S. Third Fleet lay in wait for a possible attack by enemy naval units in the Philippine Sea, to the east of the central Philippines. The U.S. Seventh Fleet protected the entrance to Leyte Gulf and the beachhead. On October 23rd and 24th, two Japanese naval forces proceeded eastward toward the U.S. position on Leyte. At 9.10 a.m. on the 24th, Halsey's carriers launched their planes in an attack on the enemy's central force. At 10.20, the enemy fleet was spotted entering the Sibuyan Sea. The U.S. planes attacked immediately. Some 250 U.S. planes hit the enemy fleet. Succeeding waves of U.S. planes kept up a continuing attack for five hours. At 3.30, the Japanese force turned and withdrew after hits had been scored on several of its warships. Survivors of the super battleship Musashi, sunk by U.S. air action, were picked up by other enemy ships. The enemy's naval strategy called for a decoy force to try to lure Halsey out of position. Halsey bit. He took his third fleet north to meet the expected threat, since he thought that the enemy's central force had been routed. But that force had reversed itself again. Seventh Fleet escort carriers were all that stood between the Leyte beachhead and the Japanese Central Force, which slipped through San Bernardino Strait at midnight. Meanwhile, the main strength of the Seventh Fleet was concentrated on Surigao Strait, as the enemy's southern force approached it from the other side. A division of PT boats, commanded by Lieutenant Weston Pullen, spotted the vanguard of the enemy's southern force. All during that night, we were under heavy attack from the enemy's warships, but some of our boats managed to get close enough to do some damage. The battleships of the U.S. 7th Fleet, which were equipped with the latest radar apparatus, waited through the night until the enemy came well within range of their guns. The enemy force was moving right into the trap. Some of the battleships used radar fire control devices. The gunners held their fire until the enemy's lead ship was only 21,000 yards away.
In the Battle of Surigao Strait, the enemy's naval force was overwhelmingly defeated. But the Japanese Central Force knifed down from San Bernardino Strait and attacked U.S. escort carriers and destroyers, sinking four ships. Meanwhile, to the north, the powerful U.S. Third Fleet, commanded by Admiral Halsey, was pursuing the enemy's decoy fleet, which the Admiral was convinced constituted the main enemy striking force. On the morning of October 25th, the Third Fleet was hundreds of miles from the battle off Samar. Word of the engagement came through, but Halsey's force continued chasing the enemy's suicide fleet. At 8.10 that morning, Halsey's plane spotted the enemy, and within 10 hours, his task force sank four Japanese carriers. The remnants of the decoy force turned and fled. Halsey sped south, but too late. The Japanese Central Force unaccountably left the area. Confusion and uncertainty characterized the actions of commanders on both sides during the battle for Leyte Gulf. This epic naval battle marked the end of the Japanese fleet as an active surface force. In spite of faulty coordination between top U.S. commanders, the battle for Leyte Gulf was a resounding U.S. victory a victory which ensured the success of the Philippine campaign, since no further large-scale naval attacks could be made by the enemy on the Philippine beachheads. The battle for Leyte Gulf was a notable milestone on the road to the final defeat of Japan. During the last days of October and throughout November, the battle for Leyte Island continued. The enemy strengthened his force on Leyte by sending reinforcements from Luzon. As soon as Japan's show plan number one for the defense of the Philippines was put into effect, some 40 to 45,000 Japanese troops were moved from Luzon and other islands to Leyte. But these reinforcements were usually dispatched in oddly assorted lots. Thus, the Japanese on Leyte were never able to function as a single coordinated fighting force, and the movement of troops to Leyte was draining the strength of the elite Japanese 14th Area Army, whose men had been prepared to fight a carefully planned defense of Luzon. On Leyte, the soldiers who arrived safely were simply added to units which were fighting a losing action against the American GIs. The fight for Leyte finally resolved itself into a series of small unit actions. The enemy's casualties on Leyte continued to mount. During the battle for Leyte Island, Japanese pilots introduced a new kind of aerial attack. Suicide pilots, or kamikazes, crashed their planes into U.S. ships. A number of American ships of all types were rammed in these desperate attacks. The ship's crews could expect little advance warning. successful in their farewell dives. On shore, the battle for Leyte Island continued, with the GIs advancing quickly. By December 1st, there were seven U.S. divisions fighting on Leyte, three of which had joined the fight after the original landings. The key port city of Ormoc fell to the 77th Division on December 11th. By the end of the year, all organized resistance on Leyte had ended, and the island was once more in American possession after three years of enemy occupation. Meanwhile, U.S. troops went ashore unopposed on Mindoro on December 15th and quickly established a beachhead as a base for subsequent operations. 
Then, on January 9th, 1945, four U.S. Army divisions invaded Luzon, focal point of the Philippine campaign. The G.I.s landed at Lingayan Gulf. Early that afternoon, General MacArthur went ashore to inspect the rapidly expanding U.S. beachhead. The general was jubilant. The lack of opposition confirmed his conviction that the enemy would be taken by surprise. He considered the Lingayan operation an unqualified success. The 68,000 GIs who landed on that first day were given a warm welcome by the overjoyed Filipinos, who had been dreaming of this moment for three years. The troops were not accustomed to making this kind of an invasion. The landing at Lingayan Gulf had little in common with previous assaults made by the GIs in New Guinea and the Solomons. Filipino guerrillas who had carried on sporadic raids against the enemy during the black years just ended, enthusiastically joined forces with the GIs, volunteering to act as scouts. Guided by the Filipinos, the American drive southward toward Manila gathered momentum. The GIs passed numerous dugouts where enemy soldiers met their death along the 117-mile route. The American advance moved swiftly through the remnants of the enemy's elite Luzon force. Heavy U.S. air attacks were made daily on airfields near Manila. With the enemy's airfields under almost constant attack, GIs of the 37th Infantry and 1st Cavalry Division closed in on the capital city from the north. By February 4th, both divisions were moving through the suburbs and were ready for the crucial battle for Manila itself. The drive to capture Manila proper began with heavy fighting. The GIs were well aware that it would be a tough job. The enemy was prepared to defend every building and took a heavy toll of U.S. fighting men. The streets of Manila turned quickly into a battleground. In the bitter fight for the Philippines' capital city, the GIs of the 1st Cavalry Division made their first objective the camp where many Americans were held prisoner. Among them, Army Nurse Lieutenant Eula Fales of Houston, Texas. It's hard to describe how I felt when the first American soldiers reached us at Santa Tomas. The great surge of joy on being free again is almost too much to bear after 32 months of being prisoners. Without any question, it was the happiest moment of our lives. The prospect of actually going home again was a little hard to get used to at first. I think we all felt that we were getting a second chance at life, a chance which some of us didn't expect. Outside Manila at Cabana Tuan prison camp, American fighting men who had fought the desperate defense of Corregidor during the early months of the war were liberated on January 30th, 1945. At Bilibid, another camp in the Manila area, more Americans were freed after three years of imprisonment. Some had managed to survive the ordeal. Others had not been so fortunate. One American prisoner had died the day before the camp was liberated. The fight for Manila continued unabated. On February 15th, the struggle shifted to a strange setting for such a grim engagement, Harrison Ballpark.
General Mudge himself helped a private who had been wounded remove a casualty to safety. The ballpark was finally taken. By February 23rd, the fight for Manila was centered in the Intramuros, the old walled city. GIs of the 129th and 145th Infantry Regiments swiftly annihilated enemy resistance. For four weeks, Manila existed in a state of complete chaos. To the residents of Manila, February 1945 was a month of horror. February 16th, an assault by air was made against Corregidor, the historic rock in Manila Bay. More than 2,000 men of the 503rd Parachute Regiment were to make the jump. The C-47s flew over the one-half square mile head of Corregidor at low level and prepared to eject their cargo of experienced assault troops over the target area, two small patches of clearing. The men jumped from a height of only 400 feet. An 18 mile an hour wind complicated the problem of landing precisely on the two pinpointed spots. But most of the men made it successfully to the designated areas. The operation went off on schedule, but not exactly smoothly. A few of the men missed the rock entirely. The operation was considered eminently worthwhile since the enemy had not prepared for an attack from the skies. One hundred sixty-seven men were injured in the spectacular drop. Once on the rock, the paratroopers went right to work on fulfilling their assignment, to rout the enemy out of his last-ditch defenses on the island where American fighting men had made their unforgettable stand in 1942. To reinforce the air assault, the 3rd Battalion of the 34th Infantry Regiment landed on the south shore of Corregidor. The troops pushed ahead quickly to take Malinta Hill. Opposition on the beach was negligible, since the enemy had been caught completely off guard by the air invasion. In addition, the landing on the south shore of the island also came as a surprise to the enemy, who had expected an assault on the northern beaches. The fight for Corregidor lasted for almost two weeks. Soon after the seizure of Corregidor, General MacArthur arrived for the formal ceremony which marked the island's return to U.S. possession. He ordered the assembled troops, hoist the colors, and let no enemy ever haul them down. Corregidor was a notable milestone on the road to Tokyo. Three days after Corregidor was invaded, Iwo Jima, some 1,600 miles to the north, was assaulted by three divisions of United States Marines. Marching on, but freedom, freedom, 
freedom fight.